just want to start with giving honor to Bishop Blankenship for allowing me the opportunity to come again and also the pastoral team. And uh, there we go. I'm, I'm so thankful to be able to bring the word this evening. I don't take this opportunity lightly. I'm so thankful for the Hampton Apostolic family that made it out tonight. See, now I can't preach bad because they're here and they're going to bully me if I do a bad job. So I'll try my best not to embarrass the church. <laughs> I give honor to my family who they make so much sacrifice so I can do this job. So I'm very thankful for their support. I'm going to read an opening verse. We'll pray and then we'll go ahead and hop right in. Isaiah 55 Isaiah 55, we're going to read verses 8 and 9. And it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. If we could just one more time just pray and ask that Jesus would meet us here. Let's just pray for his presence to have our hearts and our minds open. We love you so much. be conformed to your image. We give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name, thank you. You may be seated. For the month of July, oh, well, before I hop into it, I want to give you guys a report. God has been blessing us greatly in the city of Hampton. God has been very good to us. Our average attendance has been in the mid-50s. Thank you, Jesus. Today, we had 57 in the house. Two weeks ago, we had 64, so God has taken us higher and higher in the name of Jesus. Up to this point this year, we've had, we have had nine baptized and four filled with the wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost. We rejoice that just yesterday we had a miracle baby born. There was a dear sister who was struggling with infertility. We prayed for her, and yesterday the beautiful baby was born with no complications. God is moving in the city of Hampton, and this, I'm so thankful. I've talked with some brothers who are also planting churches, and they talk with me, and they say, my goodness, they say, the work is really coming along. It's moving at such a quick pace. And I testify every single time. It's because we're a daughter work. It's because we're supported and we have the covering of a mother church. We have people here. There's people in Hampton that are blessed because of prayers that are happening here. And they don't even know that you guys are praying for them. I'm so thankful for the covering of this assembly. We would not be the church that we are without this assembly. So I give thanks to an honor to all of you here. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, with all the pleasantries out the way, let's, let's get into this. In the month of July, God gave me an assignment. I was tasked with listening to a sermon every single day. But it wasn't just any old sermon. It had to be sermons before the year 2000. And so I spent the better part of July of listening, for, for, uh, listening to preaching primarily from the 70s. And they preached very different than the 70s. I was able to hear wonderful speakers like J.T. Pugh and in a urchin, a lot of the pioneers to this movement that we're a part of. And I was struck by something as I was listening to their preaching. Every time they spoke, there was such a great weight and urgency. 
every time they preached. I could feel wherever I was, whether I was listening to it in the car or at the gym or at my house, the atmosphere would literally change wherever I was. And I was even just listening to it in my headphones. I would feel the atmosphere shift. There was such a great gravity. And and I began to pray and talk to the Lord. I said, Lord, is this just gravity because they're old men? Or is, am I not praying enough, Lord? If I've not fasted enough? What, Lord, give, give me some insight. I, I, I would love to impact the way these men have impacted their generation. Because if I'm being honest, I can't say that my words carry the same weight that theirs carry. I'm humble enough to admit that. It's embarrassing. I'm out here preaching my guts out, and uh, these guys will get up there, will talk, and then just the Holy Ghost would break out. I said, if I talk like that, people would fall asleep. <laughs> I, one preacher in particular, T.W. Barnes, the man talked for 20 minutes, and there was like three tongues and interpretations in that one service. People were getting healed. I'm like, whatever they got, Jesus, I need it. <laughs> And so I I began just to seek the Lord, and I was like, okay, what is it about these men that allowed them to be so impactful? And of course, there's always many, many reasons. I think age does play a factor. You build reputation. You have the respect of the people. That just comes with faithfulness and time. I believe that their prayer lives certainly played a role in all the ways that they dedicated themselves to God. All of that played a part. But there was one thing that the Lord began to deal with me about that they possessed. And this is going to be important because this is how you know this is not a sermon about how we can all be better preachers. Because that's not what this is about. (laughs) Just in case you're curious. But he said it was a mindset that these men had that caused them to be so different. The Lord described this mindset to me as their perspective was cosmic. Now, I don't mean something hippy-dippy, all right? I'm not talking about something new age or something strange. That's, That's not at all what I'm getting at. But it's just that they had a view of reality that touched every aspect of their lives and caused them to live genuinely different. What I feel charged of the Lord to do this evening is to help share what I believe that mindset was and why it'd be advantageous for us to have that mindset. And I feel so strongly that this is from the Lord because as he was sharing this sermon with me, I told the Lord, I don't want to preach that. There are so many things that are much more exciting. I don't know how your relationship with God is. I'm a little sassy with the Lord sometimes because I'm slow and I need it done clearly for me. I was like, Lord, this is not the exciting, get them up on their feet. You know, I'm freshly ordained. I want to show off my preaching shops, Lord. I want to show them how anointed I am. And uh, that's not, and I pressed them a couple times. I said, Lord, can I get something different? And then he thundered at me one time. He said, you will preach that word. I said, okay, all right, I'm going to preach it then. I'm going to preach it then. My prayer is that the Spirit of God will come and bring fresh life into our walk with God, that as we begin to adopt this mindset, that it will breathe life into our walk with Him. So let's, let's get into it. The cosmic perspective. There's two aspects that made this mindset so powerful. First is that they were deeply aware of spiritual realities. Okay, what does that mean? What does it mean? They had a conviction that the world that we lived in was more than what could be discerned with our five senses. 
but they took that seriously. For us, anything beyond our five senses is when we pray sometimes, or for some of us a little more frequently, but it's when we pray, we act as if we at least believe that there's something beyond the world that we see. But they were convinced that there was a depth of reality that was unseen, but was working in this world. And because they understood the nature of this unseen reality, oh my goodness, the advantage that it gave them, the peace that it provided. What I mean is that the spiritual world, and, and I don't say this to minimize God, not at all, I'm not trying to do that, but this spiritual world, this unseen world is dynamic and populated with all sorts of spiritual beings. And they are active, and you're like, oh, well, I don't know about that. Have you seen the deception that's happening around the world? That's not God's doing. God's not bringing deception to all these people. There is a dynamic spiritual world that is exercising influence all around the world. And they understood these concepts it allowed them to understand that there's sometimes that there's things that I did that had to be done in the natural. There's some things that need to be done by being organized and being diligent and being faithful. We certainly need all those things, but they also understood that there's another dimension that required us to do a work in the spirit. It is true that then we need to apply this to our lives. Have you ever felt stuck? You ever felt like you couldn't make any motion forward? You ever felt like no matter how much you struggled, you, you just felt stuck in the place that you are? Could it be that it's not something in the natural that needs to be addressed? Definitely check that. Be diligent with your disciplines and all those things. But could it be that there's something that needs to be broken in the spirit? The Bible teaches that there is an active spiritual world that is invested in the drama that is called the redemption of man. Every time you make a step toward God, Every time you make it up in your mind to do something for God, you can expect resistance. There are unseen forces that are invested in your walk with God. Let, let me help you to see why this matters so much. Second Kings chapter 6. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us is more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire around Elisha. What's significant about this verse is those spiritual beings, these are angels surrounded around this mountain, they were there whether the young men could see it or not. They were working and having an influence on the situation, whether he could see it or not. Which means whether we are even aware of this spiritual world, it is working whether we see it 
or not. But when you begin to allow God to give you the ability to discern what's happening in the spiritual realm, you can have peace like Elisha. With his eyes, there was one story being told. I was surrounded by armies on all sides. But in the spirit, there was an even greater army. Because he could perceive all that reality had, he could walk in peace. It's easy to see the news stories and the social media feeds and be eaten up with fear and anxiety. You can hear stories about tensions rising in the Southeast Sea with China getting aggressive. We can be worried about the escalation of war in the Middle East. We can be concerned by the ongoing war in Ukraine, Russia. We, we hear all these things and we say, oh, well, wartime impacts our economy. We, we see the inflation. We can feel all these pressures on all sides and be eaten up with anxiety. That's, that's natural. But if we could just begin to lift our eyes just a little bit higher, if we could allow the Spirit to let us to see beyond the news headlines and beyond what we're seeing on social media, if we could allow the Spirit to cause us to see beyond these things, we can see the greater spiritual realities moving in the background. You see, there's often times we feel like our world is falling apart, and if you're paying attention, it feels like the very fabric of our society is being undone. There are things that are happening in the social world of the American culture that would have been unheard of decades gone by. But when we're tuned to the Spirit, we could get to the place like Abraham. Genesis 18, he says, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? It is God's desire for us to substitute Abraham's name there and put our name in that slot. He doesn't want any of his people to be in the dark or ignorant about the times that we're in. He doesn't want us to be fearful about the time. I need you to understand what I'm trying to communicate. It doesn't matter whether America is the most booming economy in the world or we become a war torn nation. We need to have the confidence that my Lord is speaking to me, and my confidence is not in human governments, but is knowing that God has a plan, and I am able to be tuned in to that plan. The other aspect of that mindset that they have, it was they lived in light of eternity. So one, they, had a re, uh, they, had, they were painfully aware of the spiritual world. They were painfully aware of the spiritual world, but also they lived in light of eternity. You see, when, if all you have is 70 or 80 years of life, when you have a problem, it can feel so much bigger than what it is. When all there is worth considering is the here and now and the life that we have, oh my goodness, the injustice in the world will absolutely drive you crazy. There's Man, there, I'm sure there's enough of us here who've lived long enough to have endured some serious wrongs. You've been wronged real bad, I'm sure. I'm sure some of us have some horror stories of the things that happened, and if all there was in life was the 70 or 80 years here, my goodness, imagine being the victim of child abuse, and you don't get out of that till you're 18. I spent a quarter of my life being abused? Is this the justice of God? 
Is this the justice I've been promised when a quarter of my life was spent being subject to a person who didn't know God and now this is the lot that was given to me? If all we have is 70 or 80 years, when you're in a difficult marriage and things don't seem to be going too well, you say, God, I'm trying to do it right, but this is stressing me out. If all we have is what, 70, 80 years? These situations can feel like it's more than we can bear. But when we realize that the life that we're living now is not the final say, that in fact there's coming a day where we're gonna take off this mortality and we're gonna put on immortality and this little life that we've lived becomes a blip in light of eternity. I want to read to you one of my favorite passages, one of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I didn't give them all the verses. I'm sorry. It's 2 Corinthians 4. I'm going to read it quite a bit. I'm going to read 7 to 10, and then I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to start pick back up at 14. I'm going to read a bit because I can't elaborate better than how Paul wrote it. There's just some things Paul just did it better. And so I'm going to let Paul say it. Look at this. He says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We've been cast down but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Knowing that he which raised us, raised up the Lord Jesus, shall raise us up also by Jesus and present us with you for all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving may redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet inward we're renewed day by day. Don't things be going wrong on the outside, there's a renewing that happens day by day. Why is this renewing happening? He tells us here, he says, for our light affliction is but for a moment, but it works a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Oh my goodness, we are on the outside It feels like everything is coming against us, but we can be renewed day by day. And this is why, verse 18, while we look not at things which are seen, but as things which are not seen, but the things which are temporal, Uh, the, The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When we get our mind off of what's happening here and we get our mind fixated on eternity, we can tap in to a daily renewal. Too many of us are walking around in our walk with God, beat down, broken, defeated, and feeling weak. It's because your vision is on what's happening around you. You have to put your eyes on eternity. You have to have a clear vision of heaven. You have to have a clear vision of where this is all going. We have to have a clear vision of the prize that's set before us. Because, listen, it don't matter how bad your day is. When you get to thinking, oh, he's going to wipe every tear away. Every wrong, he's going to make it right. Oh, I'm not going to have pain in my body anymore. 
oh, I'm going to have joy forevermore. It doesn't matter what circumstance you're in. You say, oh, I know the day is coming. I might feel rough now, but there's coming a day where I'm going to never feel this way ever again. We cannot allow our peace to be robbed. We can't allow stress to get the victory over our life. We can't keep allowing our circumstances to derail us because this life is not the final word. One thing I deal with pastoring far too often is that, you know, this thing will happen. You, you'll get tickled by the Holy Ghost and it'll feel real good. But then life will get hard. Then you start having problems. And you realize, oh my goodness, being a Christian doesn't mean that all my problems go away. And so now that we got problems, we get so fixated on these problems that we have difficulties focusing on God. There's some people that say, well, pastor, I'm just not up to service today. I'm just, I'm just not really feeling it. I'm, I'm just really going through it. And, and, I'm, and I'm a real nice guy. I have a lot of patience still. I'm young and I still got a lot of patience. So I'm like, hey, I know exactly where you're at. Praise the Lord. I feel you. Do what you got to do. But the reality is, in the midst of their difficult situation, the very place that they need to be is in the house of God. Because when we're alone with our thoughts, we're going to ruminate. When we're alone with our thoughts, uh, we're going to sink down deeper and deeper into our carnal thinking. Uh, I'm not saying come to church and fellowship and all that. With I'm saying block all that out and say, today, Jesus, uh, I'm hitting this altar, and I'm going to pray, 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 and pray until I get what I need from you because I can't get it from anybody else. Uh, I can't get it from a conversation with anybody else. If all, and I'm going to borrow from Paul, if all we have is the here and now, this life is miserable at best for most of us and absolutely hell for some of us. But when we have the glorious light of eternity looming over our lives, it will shine even in the deepest darkness. And so, okay, that's our foundation. We've laid the foundation. We got to have this perspective. We got to become more aware of the spiritual world around us. And I'm going to get more practical here in just a moment. So I hope you make more sense of that. Um, because especially that point, because I was real, I'm going to be honest, I was quite a skeptic early on in my faith. And I would hear things. And so we'll talk about that. So we need that. We got to have that awareness of the spiritual world and we have to have an understanding of eternity. So now, when you have this mindset, what we're going to do is we're now we're going to take it and just apply it to just a couple areas of our life. So you can see it in action. Now, the homework for you is to figure out how do I apply this thinking to all of my life. I can't do it all for you now. So I'll give you just a couple, and then you can figure out the rest of them. Um, the one that was hardest for me to see early on in my walk with God was being in tune with the spiritual world and how it impacts ideology. That was very difficult for me. I'm going to be honest. I was very skeptical. I heard a phrase. I was like 16, 16, 17. I heard a phrase. Somebody said, oh, that's just, uh, that's, that idea is demonically driven. I was like, wow, if that is not Christian rhetoric, then I don't know what is. They're like, I, 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 what does that mean? I heard that phrase. I'm like, that means absolutely nothing to me. What, what are we saying? How can an idea, I mean, the concept didn't even make sense to me. I was like, demonic driven ideas? Is that just your way of saying, I don't like what this person believes, so I'm gonna call them a demon? Like, like what are we doing? I, I really didn't get it. I didn't get it. And so, at some point in my, in my thinking and my praying and reading the word, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm just not seeing this concept in the Bible. You know, maybe it's just some old school Pentecostal stuff and I'll just get it along the way. 
all right, I'll just be optimistic. Until, like, it's plain in your face, and you're like, they were right, I just wasn't reading my Bible properly. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10, this is a notable quote. Like, we know this verse, but, like, we got to really get what it's saying. It says, though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. Like, okay, this is talking about spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare that's happening here. And this is happening in the mind. I'm so slow. I always thought this was like, yeah, it's my thoughts that I'm warring against, and so that's where all the imaginations. I don't implant every idea and thought in my mind. I'm influenced by somewhere, which means these ideas that are coming into our mind, these imaginations, these thoughts that are coming into our mind that are contrary to God, they have to be warred with, which that opens us up to a reality we have to really consider. Some ideas are propagated not by human genius, but spirits that are trying to hinder the work of God. Which means the way we contend with these ideas is not with human efforts, but we have to war in the spirit. You can lobby on Capitol Hill all you want, and it's your civil liberty to do so. I, I support whatever, your constitutional rights, do your thing. That's totally fine. But if there's some ideologies that are creeping into your home or creeping into your neighborhood or creeping into your schools, and what we need to do is we need to win that battle first in prayer. We have to win that battle first in prayer, and then God would meet our efforts with the prayer. It's not that we're less powerful or less effective than the previous generations. It's just that we have to learn to win some of these battles in prayer first. So let's say, oh, I'm trying really hard not to be controversial. So let's say you have a public school system and there's ideas that they're putting forth that you're not a fan of. And you think that it's not appropriate for children to be exposed to these sorts of ideas. I'll leave it at that. What we'll do often is we'll just go to the school and make a fuss and make a stink about it and say, don't teach my kid that. You're a dirtbag. Don't do that. And then we feel self-justified and we walk away. Okay. What we should do first is go to God in prayer. There's something that got a spiritual inroad into that school, and if that's where your kid is, there needs to be prayer and fasting that is made for that school. We need to go before God in prayer, fasting, and then you can get direction from God about how do I, how, how can I bring a godly influence into this place? We have to be mindful of the ideologies that we're entertaining. We may think it's just a harmless idea. Oh my goodness, let, let me give you one example, then I'll move on, I guess I'm getting low on time. So let me, let me give you one example of this, and I'll move on. There's this idea, it's a popular in a lot of churches. It's this idea that God is love, true. So that's true, that's good. Second step, because God is love, and he loves perfectly, surely, he would never send anybody to hell. Which, if depending on how you think about it and word it, that's not necessarily too crazy, but it's, it's where it goes from there. And because God won't send anybody to hell, I can do me. Because God loves me. Because he loves me so dearly, it doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter how I approach my God. It doesn't matter if I have to come to him on his terms. None of that 
is a consideration because our God is love. And that doctrine is sending so many people to hell. And I don't say this to be a brimstone and fire type of person. I'm really not. I'm, I'm a quite a gracious preacher, but it, it, the love of God, can I tell you what the love of God is? It's very much like a marriage. You don't love your partner so much that they can do whatever they want. I don't get to yell at my wife just because I'm not in a good mood. She would be very unhappy. She's a sentient being and has preferences. God is a sentient being with preferences. That's, God has preferences. And when you realize that, true love is figuring out how does God like to be loved? Because we would do that with any other relationship. So when it says God is love, we need to also figure out, okay, Jesus, what's your love language? I can tell you what it is, repentance. I can tell you what his love language is, being faithful to the house of God. I can tell you what his love language is. It's prayer and reading his word. That's how Jesus likes to be loved. Okay, let's press on, let's press on, let's press on. Two more things I want to say, and then we're going to wrap it up. Two more things I want to say, then we're going to wrap it up. Okay. When we adopt a cosmic perspective, it allows us to see evangelism and discipleship with a brand new lens. It's not a buzzword anymore. It's a personal commission for all believers. And we are called to the Lord's army. And let me tell you this. There is nothing more front line in the work of God than working with lost people. Working with people who don't know Jesus, that is front line ministry. That the Navy SEALs of the kingdom of God are those who are war- working personally with the lost. Because, my friend, it is challenging It is challenging. You're dealing with people of very diverse backgrounds, and you don't know what sort of things these people are dabbling in. You know, you have wonderful friends who decide, you know what, I'm going to be a tarot card reader today. Okay. Like, I have a wonderful family in our church. They are fully practicing Wiccans, and um, their kids come to church, and they drop their kids off. We're a babysitting service for them. Praise the Lord. But, um, you know, they're, and they're real nice people. I, I have no problems with them. But, my goodness, they are very, very wicked. And, and, and when I'm ministering to these people and I'm stepping into their homes, to, to type all the symbolisms and all the conjuring of spirits, and then, of course, the kids in that house are very confused. Those are the most confused children I have ever seen in my life. Those kids are very confused. And it's just no order, and you go in, there's no peace. It's just, it's a difficult situation. And if your spirit is not right, you going into these situations, this is frontline ministry. This is, if you want to engage in spiritual warfare, easy, easy, teach a home Bible study. You, You will be thrown into the midst. If you've never experienced spiritual warfare, I got you. Teach a Bible study. everything will be opened up. You will become more spiritually sensitive than you care to be because you are teaching the Word of God and you're snatching people out of the kingdom of the enemy. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave it alone. I have one more more point and then I'm going to be done. One more point. But the... The area of our life that's most impacted, because this applies to worship. I could talk about worship, and I could talk about church attendance, and I could go all these different ways. I could talk about our family dynamics and how this affects affects family dynamics and how it impacts our work. Like, this this is wide-reaching. That's your homework. The last way I want to talk about how this applies is in our spiritual disciplines. When you have a cosmic perspective, 
Reading the Word of God is not merely something that we do on our checklist, but it's how we strengthen ourselves against the adversary of our soul. It's the mechanism by which our thinking is changed from this world to eternity. It's the means by which we learn the story that we inhabit and make sense of the world that we're in, our daily disciplines. When you see church attendance, which is a part of your disciplines, because it shapes the rhythms of your life, it's the will of God, don't forsake the gathering. Church attendance reminds me of what is truly good. When we are faithful in our church attendance, it begins to shape the rhythms of our life around Jesus. Oh, this is a really good one. I love this. It, it, it's a weekly reminder to look outside of ourselves. Far too many of Americans are very self-centered. It's a very much us-oriented. Church is preaching that forces you to either look out or be introspective. If you're going to look at self, it's not for blessing, it's for I need to be changed. And so it's either hard looks in the mirror or attention to the world around me. It's incredible. But the one that I feel is the most impacted is prayer. Prayer isn't just something that we do to feel spiritual or not to feel like a hypocrite. It becomes something more. It's more than talking to the ceiling, but it's the ability to experience the ultimate good of the universe. Plato pontificated about the good and how this good was the standard by which everything was measured. Now, we weren't really experiencing the good because we were in a cave. See, the good is, you could say, like the sunlight, but we weren't really in the sunlight or seeing the sun. We were seeing shadows dancing on the walls of a cave, and we could never see out of it. The experience that we have of this life is just a shadow of the good. That's the life that a lot of people experience. Without a cosmic perspective, without prayer, life is just a shadow at best. You're, you're trying to get an experience of something and you can't quite grasp it. Another way that it was, it was uh, described, this life that we live, there was a Japanese Buddhist monk, he had a little poem that I thought was beautiful and depressing all at the same time. He said, to what shall I liken the world? Moonlight reflected in dewdrops shaken from a crane's bill. If you catch what he's saying, he said, our life is an accident. We're thrown into the existence that we are, and we're the moonlight reflected in the dew which means we're light reflected for something that's reflecting something else. We're so far removed from true goodness. We're so far removed. We're just being tossed to and fro. This is what life is like at best. Unfortunately, these men, they were never able to experience the profound power of prayer. When we recognize the audacious claim of what prayer is, it opens us up to one of the greatest experiences that humans can have. See, when you have a cosmic perspective, when you pray, it's not just a little talk with Jesus, which that's a nice song, that's fine. But I'm, I'm encountering the one who made me. Or if I could put it like this, the architect and the master builder of this universe, the lover of my soul, I encounter him in prayer. I am not the reflection of a reflection or a mere accident, but prayer 
is two intelligent beings with intent interacting in the most meaningful way that humans can. Prayer is beautiful. And we have to allow this cosmic perspective to reclaim the beauty of prayer. Prayer can't keep going on being a duty. It can't keep going on just being a responsibility. But it has to be encountering the one true living God. And in that encounter, we're changed. We're made different. We're made whole. Our problems fade away. Our lives he might not fix all the situations, but I become the sort of person that can endure any situation. This is prayer. This is what I want us to do. I, I want the worship team to come. And uh, I want us to, right where we are, let's just begin to worship the Lord for a moment. We love you. Can I tell you what the Lord's going to do this evening? This was a very unusual altar call for me because the way the Lord deals with me, he gives me very detailed instructions for altar call every single service. My altar call is like verbatim what we're going to do right now. I got nothing today. And I sought the Lord. I said, okay, Lord, what are we going to do? And, um, what I felt the Lord bring to my mind is that we need to have a, that cosmic perspective. We need to apply that to the Holy Ghost in our lives. My fear is that the Holy Ghost is just something that we've learned to turn on and off. We're so used to just speaking in tongues and it's just it's just something it's oh it's prayer time or I'm just speaking in tongues and, and that's all it is but the Holy Ghost is so much more than that Acts chapter 2 we know the story it describes it says the day of Pentecost was there and they were all gathered in one place and they were seeking after God. They said, I'm here for the promise of the Father. We need to be equipped to do the work that God has called us to do. If we're going to make it in this life, I need this promise. And it said, and there suddenly came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance it, this was not just a little moment in their life they say okay check I got it and so now when I pray and I don't know what to say, and oh, well, God, I've been walking with you for so long, Lord, you've heard all my prayers. It's okay. I got it. I'll just speak in tongues. 
instead of being amazed, instead of with wonder and awe at this glorious experience that we have as apostolic people, instead of being in awe and wonder at the fact that, because the Holy Ghost, and this is stuff that we teach people when they're coming to faith, the Holy Ghost is God's Spirit living inside of us. That's wild. Perfect God wants to live in union with me. Why? Why would he ever want to do that? That's because he loves us. I want everybody in the house to know that you are so loved by God because he has given you this beautiful gift. And there might be some friends here tonight who've never had this wonderful experience. You see, because this is what will happen. You'll be worshiping. You'll be seeking God. Your heart is turned toward him. You said, God, the way I've been living my life is not sufficient. It's not going to cut it. Lord, I want you because I know only you can satisfy. And with the heart toward God and a mouth full of worship, you'll be worshiping in English. And the spirit of God will come and meet you where you are. And that English is going to turn into another language one that you did not know and we forget how incredible that is when you're speaking in tongues that's not gibberish when you're speaking in tongues that's not just your mouth making noise that's almighty God moving and working in you every time you speak in tongues the miraculous is happening right before you I think we need a refreshing of this wonderful experience that we have. I feel like too many of us have gotten complacent. Oh, I'm, I'm a tongue-talking Pentecostal. This is just something that I do. No, this is a wonderful gift that I have been given. And I have this beautiful privilege of allowing God to work through me, even though I couldn't earn it, even though I can't be good enough, even though I can't be perfect or holy enough. If I simply have faith, he'll do this in me. So this is what I want. We're going to do two things at the same time. Because I believe there's some friends here who, who need the Holy Ghost. There's some people here that you've never spoken in tongues. It's okay. It's not scary. It's not something crazy or weird. It's simply God's Spirit moving through you. And He wants to do that for you here. If you're here tonight, that's because God intends to fill you with His Spirit. That's why you're, you could have been here any other night. But God brought you here tonight. He wants to do that for you and for all our friends that already have the Holy Ghost. God wants to bring revelation to your mind. He wants to take the scales from our eyes so we can have great appreciation for this wonderful gift that's been given to us. So this is what we'll do if we could all stand together. And I like to minimize awkwardness the best that I can. If we could all come together as a family, let us all come together as a family. That way nobody's being singled out, that's all right. So this is what I'd like. If I could have a couple ministers right here. Come, come here. Yes, yes, yes. And I want us to, I don't need the whole team. Just, just, just two or three will be good for now. There we go. And uh, I'll have these, these gentlemen here. There we go. We have one, two, three. If you have never spoken in tongues, If you've never spoken in tongues, 
this is your night. If you've never had that experience, it's going to be the greatest experience of your life. Oh, my goodness. And it's a beautiful thing that God can keep doing in your life over and over and over. And all you need is faith. Your act of faith is simply stepping out and coming to one of these three men. If you'll have the faith and you'll step out and say, hey, I'm a little bit nervous, but I, I find this Holy Ghost that he's talking about compelling. I, I want my life absolutely transformed. Please pray with me. I believe God will fill you with the Holy Ghost tonight. So if that's you, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll open that up. You can just step forward and you can come and meet them here. If you have a friend here you know that needs the Holy Ghost and you want to encourage them, that's all right. You can come up with them. You can grab them by the hand and y'all can walk together. And so I'm going to give people some time to respond there. Let me address the rest of the church while they're gathering here. I'm going to let them handle this. So y'all just go ahead and start working. If people come up, Y'all start praying and working. Y'all handle that, okay? So we're not, we're apostolic. The move of God's not going to bother us, okay? So we're going to let them work with these new friends here. That's totally fine. We're completely okay with that. But this is what I want for the rest of the body. This is what I want. I want us to throw both of our hands up. And we're going to pray the same way Elisha pray for that young man's eyes to be open. We need the scales removed from our eyes about this wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost that we have. I want us to pray that prayer, and then I want you to, with fresh passion and fresh appreciation, just begin to allow the Spirit to move through you. Jesus, we pray right now, God, that any complacency about this beautiful gift that we have. God, we ask that you would move it right now in the name of Jesus. Help us to see, oh, this wonderful gift, this wonderful, beautiful gift uh, that's been put, uh, this heavenly treasure that's been put in our earthly vessel. God, help us to see. Oh, God, renew our excitement uh, about this apostolic experience. Uh, God, renew our excitement about it, Lord. Uh, God, don't ever let us get comfortable with it in the name of Jesus. I said, let's just let the Holy Ghost flow. Uh, there's some things he's going to begin to minister. Let's just let the Spirit flow here for a little bit.
I said, there's a shift that just happened in the atmosphere. I wonder if you could just begin to pray for the person next to you. If it's appropriate, let's just begin to pray one for another. There's a shift that just happened in the atmosphere. Oh, God's about to take this place to that next level. Come on. Come on, push, push, push. There's another level. Come on. There's another level. There's something more that God wants to do. Come on. Consumers. Baptizers. Refiners. That's it. That thing that you've been praying about, it's about to break right now. Come on. Come on. That thing that you've been taking to God, it's about to break right now.
Let's be sensitive to the spirit. God, hallelujah. Jesus. Thank you. 
God. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank Pastor Jarvis for being sensitive to the Spirit of God. Even this morning, both words were just strong words for this body. We need to go back and listen to them and let it digest. But don't just listen to them, but let's put into motion, into practice in our lives what was spoken. Come on, prayer. Let me when you do it, it's such a powerful thing. See, I, I appreciate him bringing up that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Like, if you look at men in the Bible, women in the Bible that prayed, they were able to move things. Like, Daniel prayed, and he was able to move principalities for two nations because he prayed. Moses prayed and he was able to spare the people. Abraham prayed and God was able to reveal some things to him that he was intentionally going to hide. Man, when we pray and we get in the spirit, there's no telling what we can move. There's no telling what God's going to reveal. See, a lot of times we don't want to pray and fast because of the sacrifice and the time it's going to cost us. But if you could see what's on the other side, that's just, psh. so I, I encourage us to go back and listen to these words and go back and just put it into practice. Pray fast, seek the face of God and allow him to shine through you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on one more time. Let's just thank God for his spirit in this house today. God, we thank you and we magnify you, Jesus. Uh, God, there's no one like you. We put our trust in you, God. Uh, not in horses, not in chariots, God, but we trust you. Uh, we long after you, Jesus. Uh, and we thank you for what you've done for each and every one of us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, this altar is going to remain open if you need. If you need to go, you can go. But let's not distract anybody that's worshiping here. And like I said, let's just put into practice what God has delivered to us today and watch him do great and mighty things in our lives. Amen. Amen.